Welcome everyone to our, our UAW and UPS strike ready debrief. Uh, for those of you who were living under a rock, DSA has been running our strike ready campaign since publicly since April of 2023. That is, uh, what, like eight months, seven months of, of strike readiness. Um, and so now it's time for us to, to look back at the year in labor solidarity and uh, evaluate our work and see how we did. So my name is Ian Floor. I'm from Detroit. Uh, and I will be joined by Amanda, our incredible labor staffer, and hopefully soon Sean Orr, once he gets off his shift, uh, to really walk through a little bit of what's happened in the in the recent and not so recent months and uh, yeah, evaluate DSA's role in the labor movement. Um, so here's an overview of our agenda. First, I'll be walking us through sort of the state of the contract at the big three. We'll talk through a little bit of what happened, what was the outcome, um, and develop a, a socialist perspective on the um, the contracts at the big three. After that, we're going to have a section on DSA's involvement, where Amanda will walk us through some some stats and figures, uh, like how many pledge signers we had, and and you know all the different things DSA was able to do. And then we will have some report backs from a number of different chapters about UAW and UPS solidarity work. Um, and then finally, we're, we'll wrap up with an open discussion session. We're going to talk about lessons for the future, the state of the labor movement, uh, what we did that worked, that others should do, what we should do differently. Um, and, if, you know, just to think ahead a little bit, if you want to start thinking about your answers for the open discussion session. These are our discussion questions. Um, I don't think I need to read them out. I hope you can all see the screen. But I'll give you a couple a couple seconds to look at these, start putting thoughts together, and then we'll we'll move along. So, starting off, we're going to talk about the state of the contract. What I'm calling the state of the contract, um, and essentially just look at, you know, what happened at the big three. So the the first thing to think about is what's in the contract. Um, you know, I think most of us know that after, you know, a month and a half or so on strike, all three um, of the of the Detroit automakers reached tentative and then not tentative agreements with the UAW. Uh, at all three, there were double digit raises over the life of the contract, you know, in the in the 20 plus percent range. Um, another big win was that temps now have a path to full time, along with massive raises. Some some workers will see as a result of this 150 plus percent raises over the life of the contract. Um, we also saw that cost of living adjustments were restored at all three. And the UAW, I think this is kind of a big one, won the right to strike over plant closures. And at Stellantis, they can even strike over product allocations which will, uh, I think, open up opportunities for, you know, shop floor militancy and organizing and fighting the boss in ways that auto workers are not used to. Um, all three also agreed to bring at least some EV plants into the national agreement, uh, but there are others that will have to be organized the old fashioned way. Um, but this is also a big win for, uh, you know, workers and for the climate uh, climate movement, because, you know, at the beginning of the strike, the automakers were saying that this was illegal, that it couldn't happen due to the, the legal structures that the EV plants were set up under. And lo and behold, uh, it happened. I think it opens up a lot of new, new opportunities and paths. Um, and then finally, some workers at, uh, at part distribution plants, especially who are at different pay scales will be brought up to the full scale. Uh, I think this this was a, an important step towards ending tiers, um, and will hopefully, you know, open the door for for more of that to come. 
The other thing to look at is the ratification votes. The contract was ratified by 64% of big three workers, uh, notably fairly narrowly at General Motors, only only 54.7 to 45%, 45.3%, um, whereas it passed by two thirds or more at Ford and Stellantis. Um, and in the next section, we'll get into a little bit of what that means. Um, but it's notable that that this happened because, you know, the UAW ran a more open than than in previous times um, ratification process where workers had time to read over the contract and, and look at what was in it and were not pressured one way or another how to vote. Um, and I think that's that's another good sign for democracy. So what does it all mean? Um, I think, first of all, as socialists, it's really useful for us to think about a contract as a snapshot of the balances of forces that exist within a workplace, right? Bosses and workers. Um, a union with good leadership will usually win things in proportion to how organized it is. So if the workers are organized, militant, and ready to fight the boss, uh, they'll probably win a big contract and, and, and you know, claw back some of their surpluses. Um, but if the boss is, is ready and prepared and the workers are disorganized, it, they're unlikely to win, right? The, they're likely to have to give concessions and, and the kinds of things we don't like to see. So in this light, how do we see the results of this campaign? We can look, you know, at the previous slide and see that actually a lot of auto workers voted no. Um, and there are a lot of different reasons for this, which I think is quite interesting. Um, but there's really only one thing we can say sort of definitively that covers everybody. And it's that auto workers' expectations were raised so quickly and so profoundly that anything but total victory seemed uh, to many like a loss. You know, workers were told that they had all this power and and uh, you know all the all the big things they were fighting for, and a lot of them took that really seriously, which I think is a good thing. As socialists, you know, that's that's our goal, right? Um, you know, uh. Sorry, I lost my place. So yeah, these are these are really, really positive signs. Um, and now that auto workers have experienced a union that will actually fight for them, they're they're pretty unlikely to go back to sort of business as usual. Um, they know what they deserve and they know that, you know, when they're organized and they fight together, they can win. So, you know, the task now for for auto workers and of course workers throughout the economy is to organize. Um Many of you probably saw the the really nicely produced video that the UAW put out, uh, I think, yesterday, announcing that it's turning outward, right, and looking to organize for the first time in generations, hundreds of thousands of new members from non-union auto plants, right? Big EV startups like Tesla, Rivian, um, foreign automakers like Hyundai, Toyota, Honda, um, Volkswagen, all of these are now targets of organizing drives by the UAW, which, you know, if successful, will obviously give them much greater organization and power. But this also presents an opportunity to turn inwards and organize on the shop floor. Um, we know that auto workers can, you know, when they when they're skilled and, and prepared to do so. They can they can come together and hurt the boss in other ways beyond striking. And we even saw this during the strike with auto workers organizing together to refuse voluntary overtime and things like this. So there's a lot more capacity for these things now, I think, than there were before this strike. Um, and that's you know probably what it's going to take in order to push beyond just restoring pre-2009 conditions, which is mostly what uh, was won here. And uh, that's that's my two cents on what this all means. So I'm going to hand it off to Amanda to talk a little bit about all the great things that DSA has done in the past months. Yeah, we did a lot, y'all. I don't know if you know that we did a massive mobilization among our members all over the country to support Strike Ready, both on the Big Three side and the UPS side. So. I got a lot of numbers to throw at us about what this looked like in a bunch of different ways. 
So on the big three side, we collected 1,700 um, big three strike ready pledges ahead of contract expiration. And this was probably in the those precious few weeks between when our comrades, uh, the Teamsters got their tentative agreement at UPS and when the, UP, the UAW contract expired in the middle of September. So much shorter time span and we got again, over a thousand, uh, over 1500 of those strike ready pledges. Um, in the months leading up to the Teamsters contract campaign, we had over 5,000 comrades sign strike ready pledges. And like, you know, as we go on to the next slides, we'll see a little bit more about what that looked like in chapters. Um, so next one. Yeah. We had over 110 chapters uh, get strike ready for UPS and over 82 chapters um, nominated solidarity captains for the UAW Big Three campaign. So this is a top priority of DSA um, for a good chunk of the year, especially in the late summer, early fall. And I think the massive participation in this campaign shows it. Um, go on to the next. Um, and none of it would have been possible without most of y'all, our solidarity captains. You know, put a put a salute emoji in the chat if you are a solidarity captain. You were so critical to the functioning of this campaign. We had over two hundred and fifty six UPS solidarity captains and one hundred and seventy one UAW ca solidarity captains. Um, and y'all were the ones driving this work, um, getting your the folks in your chapter together um, to make this campaign a success. And that looked a bunch of different ways. I know that y'all were cooking. <laughs> there were several cookouts going all over the country uh, on the UAW picket lines. For UPS, we were showing up to practice pickets. We got many, many very cool photos um, and got to meet a lot of new workers and talk a little bit more about you know why it's important to our values as socialists to support workers in the struggle and let them know and know in certain terms that we had their back whatever was going to come their way so to that end i have some preliminary results you may have gotten a text from me earlier in the month and earlier in the week uh, asking for your reflections but it's not closed yet please if you haven't filled it out there's a link right there in the slides, uh, dsausa.us slash strike ready survey. Like I said, because y'all were so critical to how this campaign functioned, it's really important that, that we collect some of your reflections on what uh, went well in the campaign and what we learned from it and what we can apply to future labor struggles. Um, we've already gotten um, 65 people from 46 chapters to fill out the survey, but you know me. I always want to see the line go up. So still get it in. We're gonna take a look in the next couple of slides at preliminary numbers. So let's go see. Um, of the chapters who responded to this survey, we have a look at how many people brought, we brought two picket lines for the UAW. So most people were bringing less than 10, but still, you know, that's a significant bit some people were going going absolutely nuts with more than 50 folks on the picket line. But it is interesting to see like for any chapter, most of us are bringing just just our, our closest comrades. And you know, sometimes we're getting into the two dozen 30 to 50 range too, which is nothing to sniff at. I know if we had brought 50 people to the picket lines in North Texas, all six of them out there wouldn't have really known what to do with them. So, it, it, you know, everyone, everywhere has to, you know, kind of take their own local conditions into uh, consideration. Uh, so, yeah, that's a little bit look of a look at the UAW picket lines, and we'll go to the next slide. So, this is another interesting one. We tried car dealership canvases uh, this year as a new tactic to try to support UAW. Um, not everybody seemed to do them. And I'm really interested for folks that did or did not uh, let us know in the survey why that was, if you thought it was a useful tactic. I'm hoping that we can like talk about that a little bit in the discussion later too, because 
It was something new we were trying as part of this campaign. Next slide. Um, and this is an interesting one. How many people did you recruit to join DSA during your UAW strike support? We, we got a couple. Most people that filled out this survey, fully 43% of us said so you got at least one person, maybe closer to 10, I'll take it. But I think talking to people about joining DSA is always something that is a challenge for any sort of campaign. And I would love to see this, uh, this graph inverted. So we have 50 new DSA members at the end of the next strike in every chapter. We'll talk more about how, how we can get there, but it's just food for thought for all of us. And then on to the next. And so this is a little bit of a look at the UPS practice picket lines and how many folks, uh, how many people folks brought out to those. I know those were in a very tight window. So getting out to them, I think was more of a challenge and these numbers reflect that. Um, and yeah, well, it's pretty similar looking numbers too. It's, we can bring a small handful of people, maybe 10, maybe 20, and that does still have a really big impact. I think both U UAW and the Teamsters did notice our presence on the picket line, even if it is with a very, uh, you know, we're not bringing all a hundred chapter members. We are, but we're still, I think, punching above our weight whenever we come, um, come through to support striking workers. So on to the next. Yeah, so that's kind of a, an a thousand foot view of what this campaign looks like. I talked to a few of our comrades about, you know, sharing just a couple of minutes of what um, either of these campaigns looked like in their chapters. So I have Devin from Central Indiana, Will from Chicago, Debbie from Phoenix, and Adam from North Texas uh, lined up to give us some of their thoughts. So, uh, no particular order because we were just working furiously. But uh, Devin, do you want to tell us a little bit about what UPS and UAW stuff looked like in central Indiana? Yeah, I'd love to. So um, our stuff mainly consisted of attending practice pickets. Um, that was how we coordinated mostly with um, our local UPS 135, which is Another benefit we had going for us is we had the most TDU friendly local in the country right in our back door, which was lovely to have. And definitely they were very glad to have us out there. Um, so they're receptive day one. Now, one thing that I do want to touch on real quick about uh, car dealership and car canvassing was we opted not to partake in that no that's uaw but the reason for that was due to just confusion there was a confusion on what the goal was to accomplish who we were canvassing kind of just what we were doing so i think that kind of that's why at least we opted not to partake in that i can't speak for everybody but i know that might had a something to play with that um, and yeah, we had a very good time out there. We had practice pickets. Now, our relationship with our local Teamsters has been amazing afterwards. We, um, I myself have now became a Teamster and they have now given us the advantage of being the people that vet politicians before our union endorses them. So that's wonderful. That gives us a lot of yeah, a lot of celebration there and a lot of, uh, you know, power to put back into the uh, rake and file movement. Um, so that's just kind of how things are going here at, here at the Central Indiana. If anyone has any particular questions or anything like that, I'd feel free to answer them when we get around to it. Thanks, Devin. I really appreciate you, sir. And congrats on industrializing. That's really exciting seeing some... Uh... Midwest love in the chat. Love to hear it. And keeping the Midwest theme going, uh, let's uh, hear from Will and our comrades in Chicago next. Thanks, Amanda. Um, yeah, so Chicago um, has been uh, strike ready longer than anyone. Uh, we, we actually passed our strike ready resolution um, before National started putting together a strike-ready campaign, um, a number of Chicagoans, including some folks 
uh, on the call, Sean Orr, Sarah Hurd, and I and, and some others put together a resolution um, last fall, passed it at our chapter um, meeting last October, um, because we really wanted to take the time uh, to, to really build um, mass working class support, um, specifically down around the UPS contract. Um, so, uh, you know, our kind of first big action around that was we had some uh, major municipal elections in Chicago this February, and then again in April uh, with runoffs. And so we organized a series of um, five labor canvases for some of the aldermanic candidates that Chicago DSA endorsed, uh, where we brought rank and file uh, Teamsters um, out to knock doors for our candidates with DSA members um, and had our candidates kind of talk to those Teamsters about their contract campaign, talk about what they were going to do to support them um, if they were elected. And it, it really, I think, did um, a lot of great things. It built uh, member to member connections between our Teamsters local and DSA. It increased the salience of the contract fight for our alders who came, many of whom came around to be really key supporters later on. Um, but we did that. Elections happened. We had a series of mass meetings around Chicago around May Day. Um, where uh, we had four of them. Each of them talked about different labor struggles that were locally specific. Um, we had one about a produce warehouse fight. We had one about um, a queer health clinic fight. Um, but all of them also talked about the UPS contract and got people in motion, got them to sign onto the strike ready pledge that had just gone public right then. Um, that we followed up with a series of solidarity barbecues over the summer. Um, uh, we were the first and I believe only uh, city to pass um, through our city council unanimously, including some people that were surprising, a solidarity resolution. Um, and then the second municipality and a final municipality in the country was Cook County, the county that Chicago is in, to pass one of those. Um, and then we turned out strong for our practice pickets. And um, all of this was kind of complemented by the fact that um, uh, the year before last, we started a jobs pipeline program in Chicago and have grown from three Chicago DSA members who are UPS Teamsters into 15, 17 now actually, because two people just started last week. Um, I'll very briefly say that that sprung board us very nicely into UAW. We had the benefit of already having a close relationship with a lot of rank and filers in UAW Local 551, which um, represents workers at the Ford plant here in Chicago, including some leaders in UAWD, a bunch of Chicago DSA leaders were involved in doing a fundraiser um, and specifically with our Teamster committee doing a fundraiser for UAWD during the election. Um, you know, during all of our UPS stuff, we were also bringing out UAWD folks and folks from the Ford plant to kind of connect those two fights, um, which was really beneficial and let us springboard right from the UPS contract into the UAW fight. Um, you know, we we had another one of these solidarity barbecues. We did uh, some, some uh, fundraising. Uh, we managed to um, buy some coats and some hand warmers for uh, these folks, especially as it got colder, turned out, um, you know, a couple big days on the line where we got 25 to 35 people out. And then kind of our biggest thing um, was we organized a barbecue with another UAW local that represents legal service workers here in Chicago. Um, that was kind of a really wonderful joint project of the union and Chicago DSA. Um, it ended up being the same day that Sean Fain came to town to do a rally, which was phenomenal. Um, because it meant uh, that uh, people wanted to come out um, and their barbecue was widely successful. Uh, the Solidarity Fund money bought Sean Fain a cheeseburger. So anybody who donated money to the Solidarity Fund should feel proud that they fed Sean Fain during the strike. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I think um, it also meant that we were we, we kind of got word before it went public that the Ford contract might be settling because we had built such strong relationships with a lot of the rank and filers. Um, so yeah, I think the main lessons we took from this are just um, taking the time to really think ahead when you when you're able to and not be reactive with strike solidarity just makes the kind of solidarity, the quality of the solidarity and the the kind of results of that um, 10 times better um, because now we have kind of deep relationships with a lot of folks in 551 um, and uh, you know we're not just because the contract fight is over, we're not done building with them. Thanks. Excellent, Will. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, still curious about Sean Fain's burger order, but I'll get those details from you later. Um, and yeah, I think that this entire campaign has been a very long time coming. Um, and it's, you know, it's a 
time for us to, you know, reflect on it and start planning more for the long haul. But before we we truly go into the calendar and planning zone, I do want to pass it over to our comrade, uh, Debbie from Phoenix to talk a little bit about what these campaigns look like there. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah. Um... I don't have much to report on, but during these next couple minutes, I'll talk about what we did do during our dealership canvas. So we um, did print off those, the flyers that were attached in the strike ready toolkit. That was super helpful to us because being in Phoenix, we're not near a lot of auto maker or auto manufacturers. I mean, we're not around any. So I definitely wanted to get involved somehow and make sure that we were contributing to the campaign in some in some proportion. So I wanted to go ahead and organize the dealership canvas. And I think that our rows and thorns, which is what we say at the Phoenix DSA, um, you know, our rows of the campaign was having the strike ready material, having the flyers ready to print out, having the do's and the don'ts of what you know, UAW and National DSA wanted to see on these canvases. The do's and don'ts were really helpful, like, you know, not using the word strike or um, making sure to just keep it professional was really helpful. Um, our thorn of the whole canvas was basically just the communication and breakdown because since we were in Phoenix, there were some people at these dealerships that didn't even know that there was a strike going on. So I think that just being in the location that we were are was our biggest thorn, but that's obviously no fault of DSA or anybody here. It's just kind of the atmosphere and the environment that we're in. But we had about five or six people show up and do leafleting, which was really nice. And we have this street called Camelback Road. And on Camelback Road is where all of the dealerships are. So we were able to hit multiple different dealerships in one and talk to um, the employees there and kind of talk to them about why we're here and saying like, you know, these flyers are going to help you communicate with your customers on why auto parts might be taking a little bit longer than they than they normally are. Um, and here's why. So we really appreciated having that material ready for us. And we appreciated having, um, you know, the support from you guys to deal a dealership canvas. So thanks for letting me share on our experience today. Yeah, thanks, Debbie. I really appreciate it. And I think you all can probably tell from all the different tri types of chapters that we invited to speak in this portion. I am really interested. And I think all of our comrades running the campaign are, are really interested in what it looked like in different chapters, what people had success with, what we learned from trying different techniques. Because one of the things I love about DSA is that we're always willing to try things a little differently and do the best we can to learn from that. So, you know, the I, I'm a really big strong believer in that, like we only truly fail when we fail to learn because I'm a former educator. That's, you know, I get really corny with stuff like that. Um, excellent, excellent. And and last but not least, I'm gonna pass it to Comrade Adam from North Texas to talk about what Strike Ready was like up in the northern part of my home state. <laughs> uh, go ahead and take it away, Adam. All right, thank you, Amanda. Um, yeah, so uh, this campaign was really great uh, for our chapter in a lot of ways. Um, you know, our activity had kind of uh, died down um, in our chapter and uh, we've been rebuilding, I guess. I mean, th this campaign really kind of helped revive uh, our chapter in a big way. And I feel like towards the beginning of the year, um, we, uh, because, you know, just the morale might have been low, um, a lot of times when it came to actions and uh, supporting whatever it was, um, you know, I feel like the general attitude was like deferring to other groups uh, always like, oh, well, we could do something, but this other group uh, might be better suited to do this or that thing. Um, and so <clears throat> it was really great uh, that this campaign came along from National DSA with like a very clear uh, objective uh, for us. So we were able to sign on and, uh, pass the strike ready resolution and uh, have enough time to really build up the campaign because it started in April and then, uh, you know, the UPS contract was due on August 1st. Um, so during that time, 
uh, we didn't have an existing relationship with the UPS Teamsters Local, um, and it's 767. Uh, it's one of the largest ones in the country. And so um, the good thing was we did have time and we could kind of build this uh, new relationship, forge this new relationship, uh, you know, a little delicately. Um, but uh, it it worked out um, in that like they did finally talk to us and we were able to bring a couple dozen people out to the picket lines. Um, and, you know, just during those months, like have, uh, um, you know, just a lot of meetings and get people interested again, um, get them believe believing in uh, our project and uh, what we were trying to do. Um, and, you know, going to different events, like, uh, sometimes we would have our strike ready meetings at, uh, Starbucks sip-ins for SBWU workers. And so that was great because we got to show solidarity, um, but then also meet and get more people plugged into our campaign. And so, yeah, just during those few months, we were able to build stuff up, forge a new relationship with this big, uh, Teamsters local, um, go out to their campaign, um, uh, sorry, go out to the practice pickets um, and just kind of get the lay of the land um, more in the local labor movement. Um, so that once things pivoted to uh, UAW, um, we didn't have to do as much like legwork to get that up and running. And uh, with UAW, we had had uh, relationships with uh, one of the locals already from supporting their strike back in 2019. Um, and so also because they knew us and they liked us, we had a little more uh, flexibility um, in like, you know, being able to offer different kinds of support, more like direct communication with them about, um, you know, what their needs were um, and how we could support them. Um, and so uh, they actually went on strike as we all saw. Um, and we were able to bring uh, a lot of people out to the picket lines, which was great. And, uh, you know, we saw um, maybe some groups that we might have deferred to earlier in the year as like, oh, they, uh, like, oh, maybe that group could uh, do this better than we can. Um, we saw them like, you know, kind of joining our efforts um, and us being able to really uh, turn out people in our area like no other group could. So um, that was really great. And we were even able to bring uh, people or we weren't able to bring them, but comrades from San Antonio and Austin were able to drive up. And so there were some times uh, where we were going out to the picket lines, bringing uh, 20 or more people at a time, uh, like we did with uh, Austin when they came up. And uh, it was a small picket line, like Amanda said, um, only six to eight uh, workers at a time because it was a parts distribution center. Um, but they, you know, they really, really appreciated it. And we were able to replenish their uh, picket lines in a big way with supplies um, and, and really boost morale. So it was, it was really special um, those times when we were able to go out there with Austin DSA, <clears throat> bring a couple dozen people out at a time, uh, or even San Antonio when they came up uh, with seven or eight comrades as well. Um, and I think that's um, one of the real benefits I saw of the campaign, too, um, is just being reminded of us all uh, being in a national organization together. I feel like sometimes there uh, people talk about like some tension in DSA between the local and the national. And, uh, you know, to me, I thought this campaign was a great example of like that distinction, uh, like not or that tension not uh, really being there because we had these uh, calls. Um, you know, this campaign did a great job with the group chats uh, and WhatsApp and having these captain calls um, and supporting each other, answering questions for each other. Um, and so, uh, and then even, you know, going out to the picket lines with people from other chapters, um, it was, it was Well, I think we might have lost Adam there at the end, but heart emoji. It, I think y'all really had like the glow up of a of a strike ready campaign. Um, you know, I want that. I want that for all of us, um, really. So that's what we got on um, 
our chapter reports, but I know that's just a a couple couple of folks' perspective. Um, I don't know if you want to finish your thought, Adam, before we move on. All right, you're good. Uh, appreciate everybody who uh, let me talk them into speaking for a little bit on this call uh, and sharing your perspectives. Um, and now I think I'm gonna hand it back to either Ian or Sean to walk us through our next bit of discussion questions, no? Yeah, I'm I'm gonna hand it to Sean in one second to get to get all political with it, because we are a political organization. But uh I would just like to reiterate uh thank you to Adam, Will, Devi, and Devin for those incredible report backs. I think it's it's great to hear all the different things that were going on. And thank you so much to Amanda, who really has been the champion of all of this, putting in all the work to make sure everything was running as smoothly as possible. And now I'm going to hand it over to Comrade Sean for our open discussion. Hey, comrades, good to see you all. Uh, sorry I missed the start of the meeting, but uh, I was on my way back home from uh, from work. Um, first week of peak season over here, so we're a little busy. Uh, but uh, I was very happy to come in when I did uh, with some of the great report backs from uh, comrades uh, all over the country. Uh, and uh, I, you know, before the, we start this like open discussion, I would just like to say that for me, um, the strike ready campaigns are like the thing that I'm most proud of being involved in uh, in this organization. And I think in my entire political uh, life. Uh, I we really did pull off some incredible work uh, over the past year, and uh, that couldn't have happened uh, without uh, all of you and all the many other solidarity captains uh, around the country. Uh, because you know we took an idea, we took a kind of a theoretical approach to labor work that hadn't really been done that much before on the left in this country, and. Uh, we actually put it into practice and that, you know, that can't be decreed from on, you know, from above that requires the involvement of comrades on the ground. And that's exactly what you all did. Uh, and I'm so pleased to hear uh, those great report backs and I'm excited for this next part uh, of the meeting uh, to hear more thoughts from everybody. But the idea of uh, this, this section of the meeting is have a more open-ended discussion about uh, what we consider to have been like the impacts of a uh, strike ready campaign um, on our local areas, um, on the broader labor movement, in DSA as a whole, on the left as a whole, uh, but really like a, we want this to be a, a like kind of like an open ended reflection period. Um, you know, what lessons did comrades learn uh, from engaging in strike ready that they want to carry forward? into labor work or into other areas of work in their chapter, whether that's electoral or other uh, campaigns. Uh, what did we learn about the labor movement from this, uh, from, from these campaigns? You know, doing this, uh, doing Strike Ready, we engage with two of the largest unions in this country that are undergoing, uh, they're in the process of like a, their own internal transformation, right? Um, one uh, was a contract campaign that ended, that that did not end up going on strike. The other one uh, ended up being a strike, and uh, I would say a pretty politically important strike uh, in the history of our labor movement. Uh, so, what did we learn about the labor movement from that? And I think too, what did we learn about our role as DSA in the labor movement? I this to me has like always been uh, a question that we've wanted to answer. Uh, through our own work. Um, and, you know, we're, we're obviously, we're, you know, far and away uh, the biggest fish in the pond when it comes to the left in this country. And that's not something we should ever, uh, you know, smirk at and, and, or ignore. Um, but like there is a larger left ecosystem in this country. And there's one that has decades of, of, of approaching the labor movement down particular tracks. How did this compare to those approaches and how, how was it different from them? Um, you know, I think that 
there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from this, but we don't do that unless we engage in processes like this, processes of collective reflection, summing up of the experience, uh, and seeing what, le what we can draw from it that's going to inform our work going forward. Um, so I've got, you know, uh, a few more thoughts that I could give on that, uh, but I, I would really like to open up the floor right now and see what comrades uh, uh, have to say uh, in terms of their own reflections on this work and what lessons they're learned, they've learned from it. So the, the floor is open, comrades. I'll be taking stack in the chat. Yep, Devin, go ahead, comrade. Uh, yeah, so uh, some things we learned here in Central Indiana is simply that the workers are ready to fight. I mean, I think that's something that uh, a lot of people, they, at least I notice here in the Midwest, uh, whether it be socialists or the left in general, kind of besmirches that is just that workers just you know want another contract they don't want to strike they don't want to deal with that drama like so it can be a little disheartening for some of us that you know want that and want that kind of change and i think we kind of saw that the workers are ready for that um they want to stand up and fight themselves and they want to take a stand and i kind of learned that especially on uh with teamsters uh talking at these practice pickets to a lot of these people, some of them were hard red line conservatives that were out here ready to fight, supporting the union. So and we're, I can sit here and talk to these people and yeah, don't use the word socialism, but I'm speaking bar for bar, you know, tenets of socialism and they're out here agreeing with it, which is wonderful. You know, they don't right now we're at a point with building, I think socialism myself where it's like, you don't have to know you agree with socialism as long as you are not actively making it harder for me to implement that. You're on the right side right now. I mean, that's just the fact of how basic we are in this country of where we're at. As far as where is the labor movement now, they're ready to fight and they want to continue this up. I Where was it a year ago? I mean, when I worked at UPS, I'd say a year ago to two years ago, uh, Sean O'Brien had just got elected. And I remember thinking for some reason that that meant something and this was going to be monumental, but we had yet to see it. And we now saw what that was. As far as what is DSA's role, I think DSA's role is what we saw it is building up rank and file organizing. That's what we need to focus on is that's how you build those relationships up. I mean, I can just look at the difference in how ours went with local 135 with the Teamsters, which is very TDU friendly and very worker friendly versus how our relationship was with the local UAW here, which is more old style of how things should go. It's not very UAWD. Um, it was more, you know, follow the line of AFL-CIO and those sort of things, which rightfully have their own place in the labor market. But just seeing the difference in how much the workers were closer with us, I think that is definitely something we can't ignore. And that's the role we want, it, we want to have. Um, so yeah, I think that we continue down that path. And there are many opportunities right now for us to take up organizing for rank and file caucuses around the labor movement. And we just have to pick what we want to do. I really appreciate that reflection, comrade. I think you made a lot of great points. Um, I think that what talking about, you know, the state of the working class and stuff and people wanting to fight, I think that we got two great examples of that, you know, like on the UPS side, uh, the contract passed pretty overwhelmingly, right? But I remember during, uh, you know, the weeks after a TA was announced, there was a huge debate among the more activist layer and the, and the militants and, and the Teamsters about whether there was more left on the table. And then you saw something similar on, on UAW side with a lot of uh, folks uh, voting down uh, the TA, even though it was a, a, a significant win. And I think in both of those, it's examples of ordinary working people who are just not willing to accept settling for less anymore. 
because of all the things that have happened and all of the expectations that have been raised. And I think that's a really good dilemma for uh, the labor movement and it's a good dynamic. I've got Ian next on stack. Yeah, one big reflection for me, and I don't I don't know that I would have found this surprising before Strike Ready, but one thing that my own experiences in Detroit and then hearing the report backs from other chapters was really hammered home is the importance of having socialists in the workplace and in these, you know, particularly uh, uh, important sectors of the economy because um, just how much easier it made it for us to engage in solidarity and really, um, you know, get close with with the people we were we were supporting. Um, you know, for myself, I I chose to get a an auto job um a few months before the strike started. And even though I was relatively new on the floor uh during the strike, that was a big boon because I could, you know, go up and talk to someone and say, like, oh yeah, I work at this other plant down there. And, you know, we could we could talk on the on the on an equal level about you know, the conditions of our work. And, you know, it was very clear that we we shared the same issues. We were in, involved in the same struggle. Um, and I think broadly for in Detroit, we kind of struggled a little bit because none of the plants that got, got called out on strike around here were plants that our comrades were in. We had comrades in UAW workplaces uh, throughout the area, which is not, you know, the the luck wasn't on our side in that way, I guess. Um, but then, you know, comparing that to, to UPS, where we really only had like one solid um, Teamster contact in Detroit. But even that was was huge for us because, you know, he would organize a practice picket. We would go and you could say like, oh, yeah, I'm here because I know Thomas. Right. Like that's that's a big deal that opens a lot of doors. Um, and you know, I, I heard that coming up from other chapters as, as well, which I think is important. And then I want to highlight as well, um, maybe they'll get on stack to talk about it later, but I know that Kansas City had a, no, sorry, St. Louis. Yeah, St. Louis had a, had a, had a similar experience at uh, Wentzville, which is in Missouri, which is why I said Kansas City, um, where, you know, they, they had a trusted contact in in a UAWD member who's a trustee there and that you know that again opened the door for them to engage in in really close solidarity work and and build some strong relationships so if if we look at where the labor movement is now and where we would want to see it be in the future and especially steps for DSA members to take like yeah we should be we should be encouraging and building structures for our members to be getting jobs in these different sectors, because we know that not only does that, you know, create the nucleus of activists and organizers who build things like TDU and UAWD, but then when TDU and UAWD are successful and the union goes on strike, it also, you know, builds that bridge between the socialist movement and the labor movement. Yeah, I think that's a great point, comrade. And um, just, uh, you know, the, there's such a change in dynamic and and one that's so important when you go from talking about the workers, quote unquote, to my coworkers, quote unquote, you know, um, I think that a lot of times on the left, we have this kind of like separation of us. And then we wonder why the left is separated from the working class. Uh, so the rank and file strategy really uh, shown through uh, with these two campaigns. Shane, I've got you next. Uh, yeah, I just kind of upon reflection just learned that it's a lot easier to get people out there if it's also fun or you have free stuff for them just bringing food bringing beer or bringing games and not just having uh discussions because a lot of times people are tired of being at work and they want to unwind but then finally when they get them in a more relaxed environment or whatever they're more open to having the discussions anyways and uh you know it's just bringing more of a this 
being more social as a socialist and, you know, making things fun, having a party <laughs> and the party politics of it. It's just it makes it a more inviting and open environment in general. It's just kind of a a no duh realization, but a realization nonetheless. It's a very good no duh, you know. I mean, like if you think about like where the working class is at right now and just broader society with how atomized we all are and how alone people feel. Like sometimes it's like, you know, obviously it's important for us to talk about politics and to talk about theories of change, but also to put change into practice by bringing people together, providing things that people need, the kinds of support people want. Um, that fills a really important role, right? Um, in building class consciousness and, and everything. Uh, I believe next I've got uh, Will on stack. Thanks. Yeah, I um, I think a lot of people have said really fantastic things. And um, I think especially Sean and Ian both talked about the importance of um, having folks in the shop. And, I, you know, I think that speaks to the broader thing that like one of our main goals in all our labor work and especially with the Strike Ready work is uh, is the kind of working towards the, the bringing together of um, of the socialist movement and the labor movement at the level of the rank and file. That's really what we've you know, on a fundamental level, that's what we mean when we talk about the rank and file strategy is reuniting, remerging those two movements at that level. Um, and I think something that is a big lesson I'm taking away from this is that when we can see coming up um, a really important fight that's going to be important to a big chunk of, uh, of union members um, and that, you know, has relevance to the broader working class. Um, we can do the organizing, we can do the planning, we can, you know, do the, the, the nuts and bolts, phone calling, canvassing, all the things that have to happen to raise the salience of those fights for the broader working class um, and to provide like really meaningfully deep support for workers on the line um, that keep them going one day longer than the boss, um, but that also kind of knit together um, DSA and those unions at that, you know, uh, grassroots level. Um, and I think going forward, we should we should keep in mind that our strike solidarity is, works best when it's not reactive, but when we've um, kind of invested in that way, done the organizing in that way um, to do something deeper um, than than what we are normally able to do when we're, we're just kind of reacting and build the kind of deep ties um, that we're, we're going to need um, to fully re-knit together the labor movement and the socialist movement. I think it's a great point, comrade, and I think that uh, though building those deeper ties, um, you know, it's ha it's happened in the big cities and, and other places for like several years, right? But this was this campaign was a great opportunity for as many chapters as possible in as many places as possible to start that. I, I think Devin, uh, what you were saying earlier about Central India and the relationship your chapter now has with Teamsters Local 135 is a great example of that. Uh, Cody, I've got you next. Hi, comrades. Uh, Cody here in St. Louis. Um, I think when I think of like what the lesson that we learned as a chapter, um, I think it's still an open question. So I think UPS was mostly a wash for us just because we had no contact with the rank and file and like the leadership here in St. Louis was uninterested. Um, I mean, from the get go, when we finally got in touch with them, they told us they were praying for no strike and they had no plan or anything. So it was, it was not much for us, but UAW was a completely different story. Right. Uh, you know, Ian mentioned earlier, like we had really good relationships with, um, with people in leadership who had good relationships with the UWD um, so, you know, from the, from the get-go, you know, we were, we were, um, really involved with, you know, uh, helping support the strike even before it happened. Um, but for me, I, I, this is definitely like the most efficient and effective strike mobilization that this chapter has ever done in our like six years of existence. Um, it is not clear to me whether that will translate into, 
like a membership base within that uh within that union local um we have relationships with some rank and file people that we we just from seeing them every week you know there was a good month where we were going every weekend delivering supplies doing cookouts you know we started to be recognizable and we started to recognize people um you know we it is not clear though like whether that what that will translate into moving forward other than the continued like goodwill with the leadership um the political director and trustees and others that we we knew um that kind of gave us access in the first place um we had hoped to like do a like celebratory party like once they got a contract uh that was kind of our like our uh i don't know the the, the bullet that we were like hoping to fire um unfortunately 2250 actually like the majority of 2250 which is the local out in Wentzville actually voted the GM contract down by like 60 about 56 percent if I remember correctly um and actually don't know that that party is going to happen <laughs> um for various reasons um so it's actually kind of an open question to me like what is the next step right um because we don't there is a Toyota plant uh, about an hour and a half away from St. Louis that maybe 2250 wants to organize. Unclear. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure what the lesson is yet. Um, we've, we got more efficient in mobilizing, you know, but like what's the um, what's the next step in terms of growth? Um, I don't know. Sorry, that was, maybe that was a bummer of a, of a contribution, but... <laughs> That's how we're in St. Louis. It's definitely never a bummer of a contribution when it's coming from you, comrade. Um, but I also think that that was a uh, very, uh, um, no, I think that that's a great, I, I think that's a great assessment and like really down to earth on like where things are at. I, I see Ian in the, in the chat saying uh, maybe just a holiday party <laughs> instead. Uh, I know we're talking about that here in uh, Chicago. We're going to be doing a, uh, possibly two holiday parties with uh, UAWD and TDU um, at the, for the different uh, respective shops. But um, I, 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 I know, I know you guys are going to figure this out and keep building uh, something really solid in St. Louis. Uh, I have Antigone on stack. Hi. Yeah. Um, when the UPS negotiations started, our chapter didn't even have a labor working group. Our, none of our core members were union members. We just didn't feel that we had the contacts. We had no contacts whatsoever. And, you know, we didn't really have a lot of hope that we could, you know, do anything like that effectively. Um, I um, was encouraged to go to the Chicago um, Convention, Labor and Electoral Convention, and that really the picket line discussions. I was on the electoral side, but I, I had the picket line uh, training and I ended up, I've ended up over the years doing three picket line trainings. I thought I was totally the wrong person to be a strike captain. I thought it was ridiculous, but nobody else wanted to do it. <laughs> so I did it. And um, it's, you know, I mean, my the lesson that I learned was that if you are down to earth, if you go to the picket line and you just say, do you need gas? I'll go and get gas for you. I went and bought a container. You know, I I, um, I would go and bring gas. I would go and bring pizzas, whatever was needed, and just, you know, hang out and talk with people to pass the time. You know, you don't have to be the perfect person you just have to be the person who's there and willing to help at the time. And we do now, we have a labor group and um, just feel a lot more positive about actually being able to do labor work. So the trainings were really, really helpful because it made that seem like a possibility. You know, it made it seem, you know, and then um, when we did show up, the everyone was really generous and really um, happy to see us. So it was just, it was just great, you know, met some really, really nice people. And personally, I was devastated when it, 
picket line closed down. I drove over there and everything was shut down. It was dark. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the only thing I'd like to know, like how to whistle. I don't know how to keep those contacts going. I, I appreciate that, comrade. And that's a that's a great reflection, too. I think that um, uh and just like the just the scale of it too i mean i think sometimes when people think like strike support it's got this like big heady column and it's like what the hell is that even but going and getting gas for people going and doing some some basic things to help them stay out there one day longer one day stronger it's all it is you know um good good labor work is just good social work and to some degree right along with like the more like workplace-based organizing. Um, but I think that, you know, in terms of uh, staying in contact with the, 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 you know, the workers that you met and building those relationships, that's, that's something that you guys can continue to do. And I believe that there's some good ideas in the, in the chat ar around that. Uh, I believe next I have, let me scroll up really quick. Uh, Richard, go ahead, comrade. Hey comrades, uh, Richard, he, him pronouns with East Bay DSA. Um, and I co-chair our uh, labor solidarity uh, group, which is a subcommittee of our labor committee. Um, we were kind of gearing up earlier in the year before the, the Teamsters campaign and the strike ready campaign got going with um, uh, solidarity support for the UAW academic workers at the University of California. And then our uh, Oakland teachers uh, were on strike again in in the um, in the spring. So we, um, uh, I think, you know, I I I guess I wanted to say a few things about what I and I'm I'm new to this in the last few years, and I've learned a lot from from uh, several of you who have been in this for for much longer. Uh, and I'm still learning, but um, I was really struck at, at the Labor Notes conference uh, last year when Sarah Nelson, uh, she said something like, the strike is our tactic, solidarity is our power. And it really struck me like there, there is that power that we feel. And, and when people are exposed to that, it, um, uh, you know, brings them closer to our movement, uh, the, the the working class movement that we're trying to build as socialists, and to um, uh, and to root our our organization in the multiracial working class, which I think these two campaigns have just been really great um, opportunities for us to connect with, um, uh, you know, actual. Um, you know, what, what we used to call blue collar workers, workers who are like, you know, really keep this country running in a big way and have the power to um, to shut it down. Um, and the two things that I wanted to just mention as, as sort of aspirations um, that I keep in mind are connecting the struggles of workers across different work, workplaces and different unions. Is, is one part of it. Um, and related to that um, is connecting economic or you know sort of shop floor struggles with broader political struggles. And I think we're experimenting in different ways with with how to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, just I'll just wrap up by saying one thing that um, we decided to do uh, to sort of wrap up a year of strike support with those four um, unions and also with the transit workers who we've been working with, with for a long time was to just invite everybody to a big barbecue. And so rather than a separate barbecue or separate celebration with the Teamsters or, you know, or or one of the other unions, um, which was were things that we had thought about, we said, let's bring everybody together. And uh, we also used that as an opportunity, this was in September, uh, to have Caitlin, who's on the call, uh, and uh, some other folks talk to everybody about what was coming up at the big three. And that was just a really powerful uh, opportunity as well to, you know, just to, to have people like, have us all lift our heads up and see that um, these struggles are connected and that we're, we're more powerful together, not just within a particular workplace, but the, the working class as a whole. Thanks. 
Thank you, comrade. No, that I think those were a lot of really great points, and yeah, bringing back to Sarah Nelson's quote from um, Labor Notes. I mean, yeah, I I think that bringing struggles together via solidarity and is obviously the way forward. And I think the more and more we see DSA as the vehicle of expressing that solidarity, as we are like the actual or organized formation of solidarity in the movement, pulling everything together, I think that that's how we're going to uh, really see uh, some drastic, incredible changes in this country. Uh, AK, comrade, I got you on stack, and then the stack is open. Cool. Hey there, guys. This is AK with Chicago DSA. Um, and obviously, as far as um, our chapter goes, we had we definitely have at least a few union folks who are really, really involved uh, with our chapter. Um, but I was thinking about what Cody said. Um, I'm just kind of curious, maybe from other chapters, um, how folks have found ways to stay involved um, with kind of local unions around where their chapter is when there isn't something structured like a strike coming up. As a, that is a really good question, comrade. Is there anybody who's got uh, some some thoughts in the chat? Yeah, Martin, go ahead. Sure. So uh, through our, our labor work, and you know, we already had a pretty robust labor committee here in River Valley DSA in Western Massachusetts. The uh, we've had an opportunity to uh, involve ourselves with an existing organization, uh, the Western Massachusetts Area Labor Federation. So we've had folks involved in that, which has like SEIU, UFCW, you know, all a lot of different unions, carpenter unions that have existed. And coming up um, are folks from our labor committee uh, took it upon themselves to reinvigorate a defunct um, BDS, uh, you know, Palestine Liberation Committee that had kind of sat dormant for a decade or so when this event uh, came up in October and to start organizing to rally against legislatures to get the various uh, unions, SEIU, CIOs, uh, to sign on for ceasefire and to push for a legislature uh, uh, to sign on to various ceasefires. So uh, they're hold we're holding a rally this weekend on the 3rd. And, you know, in no small contribution in part due to DSA involvement to, you know, making that happen along with, you know, Jewish voices for uh, peace and, um, other labor folks involved. So yeah, that's one way we've been able to translate it. And that is a that is a phenomenal way. And I yeah, yeah, comrade, we haven't had a chance to talk before, but really hats off to you all out in River Valley DSA. I, I've been working with Ruth and some others uh, in the Palestine work and you all are just really, uh, you all are a, a stellar example of how DSA should be behaving in the labor movement and behaving uh, politically. Uh, Devin, I've got you on stack. Yeah, so actually our um, local, I've been able to get in contact and have the opportunity to work with Essential Workers for Democracy. And what they are is a rank and file caucus trying to make change at UFCW. Um, I currently have a signal group chat set up of a whole bunch of DSA people that also are working with this just around the country that I'm trying to coordinate to everyone. If anyone's interested in this, you more than welcome to hit me up after this call. I can uh, send you my number if you privately message me now. So that's something that I think we could uh, definitely look at. Um, as far as outside of that, it's as simple as just going to the union halls, you know, talking to these workers when they don't have a contract and actually making those realistic connections. I mean, nobody likes to feel used or like they are just a political prop. And 
workers definitely know when they're being used. I mean, you can talk to them all the time. They know when the politician is coming around because they actually care and when it's election season, just needing a photo op. I mean, so I think it's as simple as that, just staying in contact with the people. Um, if you c do not have their contact and you know what local they were at, hey, go ahead and call the local and just see when you can pop in for public meeting they more than likely the locals would love to have anyone from the community there yeah that's a great great points comrade um and yeah i i think too that uh something that's worth looking at in your local area and obviously this depends on you know other unions and other um you know, at levels of activity in your local area. But a, a good next step can also be, you know, doing, uh, working with labor notes to see if a troublemakers workshop is doable in the area or even just like a Zoom meeting or something like that. Something where you can bring, uh, you know, folks that you met at the UAW or at UPS um, picket lines or practice pickets. Um, along with other contacts that you have at other unions, comrades, et cetera, uh, get everyone into one space and get people thinking about organizing, get people meeting in a different way. Um, but uh, that, and then also obviously uh, socials are um, amazing and uh, very, uh, very useful. Um, I, I'm originally from Milwaukee and uh, I uh, one good piece of Milwaukee history that I, I always love is that the largest party in Milwaukee history was uh, when a contract was won at a UAW shop and they had 30,000 people show up uh, to the New Year's Eve party that the locals uh, threw to uh, celebrate it. Uh, and uh, it was a cool little, cool little story. Uh, Amanda, I got you on stack. Oh man, I have such intense FOMO. I don't even know what year that was, but I want to go to that 30,000 person party in Milwaukee. That sounds like a great time. There's they're the Brewers City, so I bet the beer was excellent. Oh, it was in the 30s, even better. Um, anyway, off topic. What I got on stack to say was um, I think especially like to get at AK's question earlier about like what do we do um in absence of a campaign. Um, I think doing a version of this debrief in your chapter is something that really can't miss. Like we're having this conversation nationally, but I hope y'all are also having conversations with your comrades locally about what this campaign looked like, what we learned, um, and takes taking even more time to reflect. I feel like the end of the year is always the natural time to kind of look back and think about what we did and then make plans for the year coming up. Um, and if you want to start the new year off right, you can also uh, put some time on my calendar and we can do a labor list work session where we can look at your membership list and kind of see where y'all have union members in your chapter, what sectors, what industries, where do you already have people, what makes strategic sense as a priority for you to focus on um, in your region. Maybe you have a lot of teachers, maybe they have a contract expiring soon. Um, it always is worth it, I think, to take a breath and pause and look at some of the information that we already have at hand, but maybe we don't look at every single day and um, think strategically about how we could apply that going forward. I know us on the NLC, we're going to be doing that <laughs> uh, since Sean just got reelected and Ian's now a new NLC member. You can give them rose emojis for their service in the, <laughs> in the chat. Um, it, that's always what I think is to orient to our own membership too. We want to encourage people to industrialize, but we're also already workers and many of us already have union jobs. So, you know, can't hurt to look at our own DSA members and then start having a conversation internally about what we see on the horizon. So that's my bit about it. I, pre I appreciate that as always, Cameron. Yeah, I think, um, I, I, I think you raise a, a, a lot of really good points there. Uh, Chris, I've got you on second. I believe uh, we will close it out after that. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I actually wanted to make a point about the uh, Detroit DSA's uh, participation in the 2019 uh, UAW strike. Um, my plant was actually the closest one. I was a paper member at the time, but uh, fortunately, 
Uh, Sean Crawford, who's also on the call, wrote about it uh, a little bit. And uh, one of the points I think that is, uh, in my opinion, super important was the the signs that were provided. There was were provided by Detroit DSA. If you look up the 2019 GM strike, um, you see them in just about every picture. And uh, I think that that was really amazing for, you know, getting the idea of tears like they, they, they talked to the workers uh, to, to begin with. They talked to the workers to ask, you know, what would you like on signs? Because they had a, a lack of signs. And um, yeah, everyone tier one was uh, uh, a, a very popular uh, point uh, at, 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 the, at that point. I don't think that that was uh, what that strike was about. That strike, in my opinion, was a defensive strike. And um, I think you know, you see the discrepancy with the uh, General Motors workers on the vote. And I think a large part of that is the fact that, you know, we had four years to reflect and uh, looking at, you know, what what we, you know, thought we might have been going on strike for and what we got out of it. And, you know, in a lot of ways, we ended tears this time around, at least in, in pay, uh, generally speaking. But of course, still no pensions, still no uh, retiree health care and a lot of other things. But, uh, but what I'm getting at is is it's it's super important to you know when you're on the picket line listen to talk to workers I believe everyone knows that in this but also like you know you never know when you're gonna like you know stoke the fire right and get people like pumped up and and, and ready to fight because uh if their union's leadership isn't doing that um you know it's there those people are willing to fight you know UAW is not uh, outlier, you, um, Teamsters are, are an outlier. Uh, they're all, we're all workers. We all want so much and, um, you know, we, we deserve it, right? <laughs> like, uh, the, these companies are making money hand off her fist. And if you don't work for a company, you know, your the budget of your school or, or wherever you work is, you know, uh, not going to workers. Right. <laughs> and, um, yeah, just, just being humble, uh, going to the line. And uh, it was said earlier, you know, just, you know, trust the workers and, um, you know, do what you can and, and to really connect with people because uh, that ultimately in the end is the most important thing. And, uh, you know, they know what they want. And as was also said, like they know when they're being used. So, you know, don't, you know, go in with, you know, a bunch of socialist rhetoric, you know, it's not Twitter, uh, just go, just go, you know, be a worker like you are and, um, and, uh, you know, be an equal, uh, and, and, and help them win it. And, uh, I think that, you know, for me, uh, the 2019 strike lighter fighter under me, I was never involved in anything, uh, up until then. And, you know, seeing those signs and, and thinking like, Hey, we're going to win, we're going to do this, uh, you know, and then that not happening in 2019 is, is a lot of what motivated me to do anything, uh, you know, I, I didn't know anything about organizing in general. So, um, yeah, just you never know who you're going to inspire uh, and and who else is ready to fight. And uh, I hope that the UAW strike was was definitely that for a lot of other unionists and, and people who wish to join unions as well. And, um, you know, uh, despite this being a contentious uh, voting cycle for the GM workers at the very least, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that... Uh, yeah, I'm glad we fought is, is I'm, I'm glad that we're, we're back to like our, you know, we deserve it mode and uh, it's a good problem to have. And uh, we need more of that in all over uh, the labor movement and, and all over the working class. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. That was a great, uh, great closer uh, for this, uh, for this reflection period. And I think that you put things in the right time span too, right? Cause it is, like one feeds into the other, you know? Um, I know that like uh, right now in uh, TDU, like we're really looking to you all in UAWD. And anytime I meet someone from UAWD, it's always, oh, we, we learned so much from you guys in TDU. We've been learning so much from, from the fights you've been picking at UPS. Um, I am very excited to see what this kind of leapfrogging that we will keep doing of each other for the foreseeable future uh, leads to, but um, yeah, I, 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 I really, uh, I appreciate your reflection. I appreciate everybody else who's uh, thrown in their two cents uh, in this call and uh, helping to make things happen. Um, 
I, uh, I've got, you know, much more of a reflection that I, I, I could give myself, but, you know, I, I'm going to move things along uh, for the sake of time. But I will drop in the chat uh, some thoughts that I put together for uh, Democratic Left right after the UPS fight uh, wrapped up about what I think Strike Ready represents for us as DSA and lessons we can learn going forward. So I really appreciate you, comrades, and I will kick this back to uh, Ian. Thank you so much, Sean, and thank you for everybody who participated in that. Uh, it's great to hear all these different reflections, thinking big, thinking small. Um, these things are all related and we need to do all of them. Uh, but now it's that time when we, we look to the future and we say, what's next? Um, and again, we're, we're thinking big and thinking small at the same time. Um, so the first thing we want to talk about is what's next for Strike Ready. And the answer is we're not sure yet. Um, you know, there are there are some big contracts coming up next year. IATSE, uh, the rail contracts. Uh, I believe expire right before the 2024 election. So, you know, there, there are, you know, maybe less certain, but, but no less uh, politically interesting fights ahead in the labor movement. Um, and I think, you know, this is the time for us as DSA members to, you know, plan ahead and start to think about, what does it mean for us to to build strike ready into maybe maybe a permanent function of DSA and and better prepare ourselves for the future? Um, and we're open to ideas. It's it's time for everybody to to start thinking about that. So your your first next step is just to to become an ideas guy. Start to think, you know, DSA should do, do this to for strike ready in the next year. Um, maybe start writing those ideas down somewhere and and uh that'll be really helpful to all of us in making it happen and organizing um the next plug is for dsa labor's membership meeting we have quarterly membership meetings um and the first one will be held it's seeming like the second week of january so keep your eyes and ears out for emails texts and other communications uh, inviting you to that meeting. Hopefully we will have a great agenda and, you know, that will be a good time to start thinking and, and talking about those same questions of what is, what is DSA's labor work look like for the next year. Um, the third plug is for the labor notes conference, which is happening. Uh, someone please post the exact date, but I know it's in April and, uh, you know, we, I think most of us here should already be pretty familiar with labor notes. Um, it's, of course, the the uh, troublemaking wing of, of the labor movement, and it's a place for activists in unions and activists in the labor movement all across the country to get together, uh, attend workshops, compare notes, and, you know, building the bonds of solidarity that allow for you know, UAWD to be connected to and draw from TDU and vice versa, right? Like that's the place where we try to build these kinds of bonds. So uh, I would encourage everyone here to click that link that Chris just dropped, register and uh, go to labor notes. And then finally is labor for Palestine. Um, Sean, did you have any specific plugs on this? Yeah, uh, so we, um, ever since uh, things uh, really escalated uh, in Palestine and Israel's invasion of Gaza, uh, we formed a subcommittee to defend Palestine in the NLC. Uh, right now we're meeting on a weekly basis. It's every Monday at 530 Central. And the main thing we are working on right now is supporting comrades and training comrades and how to pass ceasefire resolutions in their union locals and central labor councils. We've got a few comrades who are already on the call who have done this or have some plans in the works. Um, and uh, we are looking to get more and more people involved with this. So if you are interested in supporting uh, uh, Palestine and supporting the effort toward a permanent ceasefire, 
uh, in the labor movement, um, please uh, reach out and get connected with me and I'll uh, onboard you onto the committee and uh, we'll stay involved. Right on. Um, and with that, uh, I want to conclude on a on a pretty simple message, which is thanking you all. Uh, you know, we this was a massive national campaign. I think we had more activity uh, doing strike ready this year than we had in any other time since there was a Bernie campaign for DSA to be involved with. Um, and none of that happens without all of you, the the members who you know sign up to be solidarity captains and and show up to to calls and the members who show up on the picket lines to st support striking workers or or workers in their contract campaigns um this is you know we're a membership run organization and so every chance we get we got to thank the membership um so yeah thank you all for making 2023 a, a monumental and historic year in the labor movement uh, solidarity forever, and I hope to talk to you all soon. And you're you're now free to go.